Okay. So before we get started on tonight's lecture, I just had a few questions for uh, a first grader. This is uh, Nelson Fasilchek. And uh, Nelson, I wonder if you can tell me something. Um, what do you think about GMOs? Not sure, huh? Um, do you ever eat genetically modified organisms? You do. How, do you like them? They're okay with you? Um, what do you think about organic food? Mm, good. It's good? Would you prefer organic food or uh, uh, conventional food? Organic. Organic. Well, okay. There you have it. Thank you very much. And let's get started. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, tonight we're talking about uh, the second part of this course on applications in biotechnology. And uh, in the last lectures, we examined where our food comes from. Um, not just in terms of the grocery store, uh, but we went over a history of agriculture and then uh, the developments that led up to varietal selection and plant breeding uh, that led to the crops that now are grown, uh, that are used for the food that we make. In the second part of the last lecture, we went into the techniques that are used for genetic modification in crop plants. Specifically, how are genes cloned? How do we make transgenes? How are they put into plants? And what kinds of traits that that technology is useful for? So now we understand that we have a long history in agriculture, um, over 10,000 years or more, and that we've used various tools to produce the plants that we make that arrive in our grocery store. Now there's another tool in the box, and that's genetic modification. So uh, knowing now where our food comes from, the history of agriculture and plant domestication, and how DNA-based biotechnology has affected crop improvement, uh, tonight uh, we want to look at what issues and controversies uh, this kind of technology creates. Uh, certainly, a lot of people have questions about the use of genetic modification in modern agriculture. Now, we have an understanding that we have been working with selecting plants for crops for uh, thousands of years. So, what is new? Uh, what issues and concerns come to the table? So, tonight, we will take uh, the first part of the lecture to set the stage about food and agriculture in general. I think this is a very multifaceted topic. Uh, people would want to polarize this and make it a black and white situation, and I think it's anything but that. And I think we will see some of the issues and questions that arise and why it becomes complicated. And this is deeply embroiled in the question that we continually address in this course. Uh, that is, what is life? And now with humans, how we have the ability to work with life at the biological level. We understand now that humans have been selecting plants for our use for um, thousands of years. And now we have the capability of ma manipulating DNA and introducing traits into crop plants. We now know that all the plants that uh, we use generally uh, wouldn't exist without human intervention. That humans have been manipulating plants at the genetic level throughout the history of agriculture so that nearly all the plants that are available in the grocery store do not exist in the wild and would cease to exist without human intervention through agriculture. So we see this process of plant domestication from wild plants through the activity of humans by selection and then eventually genetics, uh, the abilities later to make wide crosses, 
even using mutagenesis to select out mutants that would be useful for humans. And lastly, we have now the ability to do specific gene transfer and manipulations. We also see that there is this um, confounding nomenclature that the public is presented with. Conventional foods, processed foods, organic foods, natural foods, whole foods, what does this mean to the general consumer? Uh, what predicts food safety, if anything? What predicts good nutrition? What predicts sustainable agriculture? So we look at crop plants now uh, in terms of large-scale agriculture that are produced by conventional farming, and we can get into a little bit more tonight about what that means, uh, and also in terms of organic farming and what that means. So this process of plant domestication and agricultural improvement that eventually brought us the plants now that uh, are useful uh, for humans through conventional breeding. Now we enter into um, recently the ability to use biotechnology approaches and advanced um, genetics. I don't mean to say now that those techniques that existed before are somehow obsolete. Uh, as this slide might indicate, I don't want to leave a false impression that biotechnology replaces agricultural techniques that were previously used. It is uh, another tool in the box. We continually generate new hybrids, new varieties that are useful in all the different crops that we currently use. So it's not as though we've transitioned away from conventional breeding technologies, uh, but we now have them augmented by DNA-based technologies. And this brings us GMOs. GMOs, as our young visitor today uh, indicated, uh, what is a GMO? You can ask this of your friends, and I've been doing this lately, and um, generally for all of the comments that I hear about GMOs, uh, most of the people I ask simply don't know. Uh, I asked a guy in my gym the other day, and he said, I don't know, but I'm against them. There you have it. Um, so a GMO is a genetically modified organism. And as I said, this ability to do this technique of genetic modification is one more tool in the box of agricultural improvement. So modern crop and plant improvement would involve still the use of conventional breeding, but now we have the ability to also use genomics, that we can sequence all of the DNA in crop plants and use that information for crop improvement. And some of the techniques that come to bear there are techniques such as marker-assisted breeding or genomics-assisted breeding, where traits can be linked to DNA sequences and followed accordingly to accelerate the conventional breeding process. We can also use techniques like association genetics uh, to identify individuals in a population uh, that have traits that might be more useful um, to crop development. And so genetic modification is on this list as one more tool in the box. And I mentioned genomics, that the uh, first draft of the human genome was published in this issue of Nature uh, in, on February 15, 2001. The draft of the human genome took uh, a lot of money, over a billion dollars and over 10 years to produce and um, it no doubt was a large step forward. And you can see on the cover of this issue uh, that the double helix of DNA is actually composed of a composite of human faces. Uh, that the human genome presents a wealth of information about uh, humans, who we are and how we got here. And no doubt uh, that was a huge achievement. And I mentioned the last lecture, what were the largest achievements technologically of humans in the last century? 
And uh, when I ask that question to students, oftentimes landing on the moon uh, is on that list. And I made the comment the last time that the accomplishment of landing on the moon may pale in significance compared with the recent advances in DNA-based biotechnology, including knowing the human genome. None of you are going to go to the moon, but knowing DNA sequences such as the human genome uh, will affect all of us. In April 5th, 2002 issue of Science, the rice genome was published. So all of the genes in rice and the DNA sequence uh, was understood uh, more than a decade ago. We now know the entire genome sequence of many other crop plants, including maize and wheat and recently tomato. We also know the genomes of other important uh, crop species as well as animals. So this knowledge is beneficial to developing new crops and certainly knowing the genetic sequence of rice accelerates the breeding possibilities as well as its uh, abilities to uh, genetically improve rice. I also went over last time the history of plant gene transfer and genetic engineering which really had its uh, beginnings in the early 1980s until now uh, where um, over 90 percent of the U.S. maize crop and the U.S. soybean crop is genetically modified. And certainly now it's possible to clone any gene from any organism and express that gene in plants. Uh, this is commonplace. Um, not that every gene has been expressed in plants, why would we want to do that? We have shown in the last lecture that certain genes for certain traits uh, have been chosen to be useful. So traits for herbicide resistance, traits for insect resistance, drought tolerance, increased nutrition uh, have been cloned and moved into plants and this is what comprises GMOs. So you can take your favorite gene and make a so-called transgene by fusing that to a promoter sequence and the appropriate termination signal and deliver this foreign DNA in against a known background of genetics such as maize or tomato and deliver a trait, a specific trait with a known DNA sequence against uh, an already established genome. And here is a short list of some of the traits uh, that uh, have been either attempted or have been successfully introduced into the marketplace. The future of this is really still wide open. While there are a handful of traits and a handful of plants that have been genetically modified, certainly this technology uh, is, is uh, wide open and will be widely applied to many different crops in the future as well as many other traits including increasing yield, um, increasing protein content as well as um, its nutrition, um, high oil content and high oil quality, uh, agricultural improvement traits such as disease resistance, pest resistance, drought and salt tolerance, cold hardiness, are all traits that can be genetically modified uh, by the techniques that we've already gone over, as well as some of the new techniques that are now on the horizon. There are recently published techniques that can accomplish genetic modification without gene insertion. These uh, use technologies such as zinc finger nucleases, um, ZFNs, uh, that have been useful for doing exquisite site-specific gene modification without introducing foreign DNA. Also talon-like receptors, talon-like proteins that uh, can also accomplish the same type of genetic modification uh, resulting in plants that have been mutagenized but may not fall under the category of GMO. Uh, and so Technology is continuously expanding in this area. Gene modification is by no means uh, over. What will be
continuously developed as another tool in the box for crop improvement. So it sounds as though uh, genetic modification is a panacea for introducing all these new traits and improving crop plants. That's the way maybe some people might see this. On the other hand, some people might see it as Pandora's box. Should we really be doing this? What kinds of concerns and issues does this bring up? Uh, should we be genetically modifying foods? So the controversies and concerns in ag biotech really are not polarized into all good or all bad, but really are multifaceted. And that's what I hope to clarify and bring out in uh, the next series of lectures tonight. And certainly there are people that are outspoken on both ends of this spectrum. Here's an article from Mother Earth News that was published a few years back uh, by a woman named Karen Carmen. She's a freelance writer for Mother Earth News on genetically engineered foods, promises and perils. And right away by that title, you can see that it's a polarizing sort of an approach. And you can see by the illustration that accompanied that article uh, that she may not be entirely in favor of this technology or its application in food crops. So I would suggest that when we look at some of the issues and concerns and controversies surrounding agricultural biotechnology and its applications, that we rely on credible primary sources, not public secondary resources uh, that are available. Um, so that peer-reviewed scientific articles would fall at the top of that list. And uh, there are a number of uh, well-established resources in this area, including the journal Science, published by the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, is probably the leading impact journal in the world on covering all topics on, on science and uh, related issues and certainly covering scientific evidence related to genetic modification in crops and agriculture as well as new techniques that are coming out. Uh, there is also the journal Nature. Uh, Nature Biotechnology is a great resource and uh, other peer-reviewed scientific articles uh, that might appear in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and uh, some of the higher tiered scientific journals. So then we can rely on credible primary resources uh, for evidence-based science and practice rather than on secondary opinions that may occur in popular press such as Time Magazine, New York Times, etc. Not that those aren't inf information uh, that that doesn't provide adequate information to, but I think we must rely more heavily on evidence-based science and practice in order to inform this debate about issues and controversies about biotechnology. And also we can look at what scientists say. Uh, Martin Crispiels, director of the San Diego Center for Molecular Biology, put out a while ago this compilation on foods from genetically modified crops, uh, and also this one on agricultural ethics in a changing world. Now that's an interesting title all to itself. What are the ethics of agriculture? Some people unfamiliar with the topic might ask, uh, do we need ethics about agriculture? Well certainly. Who eats? Who doesn't? Who makes these decisions? Uh, certainly uh, the world does not share our ethics or our concerns or does not have the resources that we do in the United States. So this informs the debate about world global ethics concerning agriculture, how our foods are made, and what choices we make regarding how agriculture is run. Also, we can look to uh, what scientists who have been involved in the field uh, have to say in peer-reviewed journals such as Plant Physiology. This was a special issue published by the American Society for Plant Physiology. 
uh, on uh, genetically modified crops. What do the scientists say? So GMOs in food. First of all, what are the risks? What are the benefits? Uh, how do we inform this debate? What is the public perception? Public perception on GMOs has guided a lot of the policy going forward globally uh, and has had a large effect on its introduction uh, into various countries. GMOs are currently banned in most European countries. Why is that? The United States public consumes them on a daily basis and grows them outdoors without regulatory concern. You could ask your friends this question. Ordinary tomatoes do not contain genes while genetically modified ones do. True, false, I don't know. This was a poll taken a while ago internationally and here are the results to that. In the United States, 45% said that that was false. Another 45% said they didn't know and 10% said that that was true. And we compare that then. Um, so what we say is, is that 10% of Americans say that ordinary tomatoes do not contain genes. And it's just genetically modified ones that do. 45% say they don't know. So about half the public does not know that ordinary tomatoes contain genes. This is a problem educationally because we can now clone any gene and move it into any tomato we want. And of course tomatoes have genes. Uh, but we compare this to similar results, uh, say, in uh, various European countries. Look at the results from Germany, for example. 44% when polled uh, this question in Germany responded that that was true. Um, I'm not sure what the German educational system is providing for basic biology, but uh, certainly there's a conflict here, or maybe it's a communication issue, I'm not sure. But this means that a full 64% of people in Germany do not understand, according to this question, that ordinary tomatoes contain genes. I've had people suggest to me that they don't want to eat a genetically modified crop because they don't want to eat any genes. Really. Or here's another one that you can see the forming of a controversy in the making. By eating a genetically modified fruit, a person's genes could also be changed. True, false, or I don't know. So by eating a genetically modified fruit, can you somehow absorb the genes from that genetically modified fruit to alter your own DNA or even uh, microflora? but especially your own genes. So the answer to that in the United States is that 39% either don't know or think that that's true. But if we look at Austria, we see that that result is zooming over 71%. So there is the concern that by eating a genetically modified plant, that those genes could then be uh, transferred into the human genome. Now this is interesting because humans eat plants all the time and I haven't seen uh, any genome published that shows the integration of a plant gene into the human genome. And certainly I haven't seen any humans taking on any traits acquired from plants. I mean, it would be ridiculous, really, to say, hey, I, I notice you don't photosynthesize so well, but that's a, an obvious example. But apply that backwards. If we are introducing genes now into plants, what's the likelihood that that DNA could be transferred out of that genetically modified plant and into a human? Yet, uh, one of my students came back from spring break once with this uh, photograph from an Italian uh, photography journal, and it's an ad from Greenpeace. Um, and the question there is asking, what are we expecting? And you can see under the Greenpeace logo 
that this is their campaign against genetically modified organisms. The implication here is, is uh, I think, pretty clear. Uh, as uh, alluding to perhaps Rosemary's baby, I think you can see that these are representing perhaps goat horns in the womb. Um, and uh, maybe you can't read this in the fine print on this slide, um, but it says that if this image bothers you a great deal, or even a little, call Greenpeace. Hmm. So um, I couldn't resist, and I called the number, and um, I got an English-speaking person who eventually replied to, the, I said, um, what is this ad all about? And she said, well, this is our campaign against genetically modified organisms. And I said, um, do you have any evidence that something like this could affect humans in such a way? And she said, well, no, not yet. I said, do you do, you do research on this? And she said, no. Um, we are a protesting organization, not a research organization. So there you have it. They would rather put money towards advertising such as this, which obviously can have a strong public impact, rather than go out and do research or fund research that would provide evidence-based knowledge on the subject. So what is the level of understanding that would send, say, this fellow that's shown off to the left here holding the sign that says, ban GM crops? What is his understanding of the technology? What is his understanding of the way that it's used in its applications? or the concerns and the evidence-based knowledge that come against this. I mean, I don't want to stereotype here, really. I'm inferring uh, from this image. But really, based on those polls that I just showed you, we can make a guess that the level of understanding that leads to a person to protest against GM crops and their use uh, might be askewed. And we can look at the opponents to genetic engineering uh, and wonder if also they don't fall under the paradigm of a professional protesting organization that is rather interested in getting funding to further their cause for protesting than it is to illuminate uh, the public on the facts. Now, Greenpeace is an interesting organization because since its inception, they have done uh, and sponsored, I think, uh, awareness to a lot of worthy causes, um, such as the uh, con confronting the whaling industry and uh, other problems such as that. But we have to wonder uh, what is their motive for pursuing uh, some of their agendas. Greenpeace was founded by Dr. Patrick Moore, an ecologist, and he was the co-founder and uh, in this quote, he says that the campaign of fear now being waged against genetic modification is based largely on fantasy and a complete lack of respect for science and logic. That's the co-founder of Greenpeace. Um, so I think to strike a balance between a knee-jerk reaction and the facts is uh, really required. Actually, to do more than that, to evaluate the facts and form an appropriate opinion. So to balance this, we can look at the green side of ag biotech, that uh, people that are in favor of this technology would say that by increasing yield per acre, it's estimated that these kinds of technologies, including genetic modification, might protect close to 15 million square miles of wild habitat. How much more wild habitat can we reduce under the plow? As population continues to increase, will we continue to deforest? Will we lose more Amazon rainforest to grow more sugarcane, more soybeans, grow more cattle? Representing one of the greatest environmental achievements in human history if we counteract that problem. Higher yields have also prevented soil erosion by requiring less farmland. 
On the brown side of agribusiness, we can see that the large companies that control large-scale agriculture produce large mega farms that result in soil destruction and render more land unarable. Uh, and so this argument is positioned against itself concerning how we produce food. How will we continue to grow the large amounts of food that are required for an ever-increasing population? And then we balance this against food safety. We just want good food, the public demands. What is the future of farming? Large mega farms or small local produce, seasonally grown? And who protects the consumer? Here is a list shown on the left of organizations um, that are involved with consumer protection and regulation of these crops and the environmental issues resulting. So um, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in this country, together with the USDA and APHIS, uh, regulate environmental release of um, genetically modified crops. The FAO and the World Health Organization also monitor this globally uh, the EPA in this country is also involved, and ILSI in Europe. Scientists are uh, involved with writing publications, and certainly the industry uh, is supportive of their endeavors. But there is a growing and increasing distrust of science in America. This has been occurring and is documented through polls over the last decade. Uh, there is a growing concern over science, which absolutely astounds me. Everyone still gets in their car, fires up their computer, uses their smartphone, and yet there's an increasing distrust of science in the United States. Why is this? How do we reconcile that we use this technology when we see the benefit and then shun it if there is any possible risk. Well, why should the public distrust science? Look at history. DDT, the Exxon Valdez, Bhopal, Chernobyl, Love Canal. The list is long and it continues. Vioxx. We had BSE and British beef, tainted chicken, Coca-Cola, contaminated food supplies. On the balance side of that, global quality of life has been continuously increasing. Life expectancy has doubled in the United States in the last 150 years. Food abundance is up in developed countries and is increasing in underdeveloped countries. There's health in old age, increased mobility, decreased infant mortality in the United States and other countries. So I think what this seems to suggest is that it's easier to create distrust than trust. I think anyone in any relationship understands this. And that benefits are okay and risk is not okay. And we'll get into some uh, analysis of benefits and risk in the second part of tonight. And then there's a, a distrust of corporate interest. Corporate interests are heavily involved in large-scale agriculture. Monsanto, Syngenta, BASF, Pioneer, Dow, DuPont, country, companies such as this are uh, heavily involved in large-scale agriculture, including the production of crops and seeds, as well as pesticides and herbicides. And as the cartoon suggests, big corporations claim that they are only helping edibles fight off the bugs and other natural enemies. Do we think that is so? In fact, we could say that these companies control the food source in the United States, and perhaps globally. Can the consumer trust corporate interest? We're all suspicious. Are they altruistic? 
Do we believe that they want to feed the world? Do we believe that they want to promote sustainable agriculture and a cleaner environment? Did you just fall off the turnip truck yesterday? And what does the consumer think? What will happen now? Franken foods, GMO tacos, playing God with genes. Is it good for us? There's a fear of technology in general. Let's just go back to better times. Do we need this? It all seems so weird. There have been controversies in agriculture and in science in the past. Let's face it. Pasteurization of milk is a pretty good example. And it was controversial when it was first introduced. Opponents claimed it was unnatural. It was seen as a ruse by the milk producers to charge more for milk. Meanwhile, 28% of infant mortality was blamed on contaminated milk. Is that a ruse by the milk producers? Or is it a way to introduce better health practices? There are proponents today of raw milk consumption, in spite of the fact that these products can carry disease. And you can see that some of these claims against pasteurization are the same claims that are made about genetic modification of crops today. It's unnatural. Is it? What's unnatural, actually? Um, if a human is involved, we are ourselves nature. So if we are involved, then by extension, this computer is natural. Is flying in an airplane natural? Is New York City natural? I think the involvement of biotechnology causes us pause to think about ourselves and our involvement in nature itself. How should we produce the food that we eat? Really? Whose decision is that? If you think locally, that's one thing. If you think for yourself, that's another thing. If you think globally, certainly that's another question. Ameritopia. That's an interesting word. Uh, it's an interesting book. Uh, but the word itself, I think, um, is self-explanatory. What is our society now? What is the American dream? Eric Fromm wrote a book in the 1990s titled To Have or To Be, looking at the American culture as a culture of having. The verb to have is a past passive verb. People, when asked to describe themselves, often respond, that I have a job, I have a wife, I have a car, I have a house. Uh, all of this is temporary, isn't it? If you've read the story of Job, it can be taken away very quickly, and then who are you? So he positions it against the verb to be, active present tense. I am a professor. I am a father, etc. We also can see that uh, waste in America is prevalent. Every day, America wastes enough food to fill the Rose Bowl. America wastes 200 billion pounds of food per year in various ways. One quarter of the food that's brought home is thrown away. So one might ask, do we need to make more food through biotechnology? Or do we simply have to be smarter about how we use it? If you go out to the Salinas Valley and look at a, canopy, a cantaloupe field after it's been harvested, there are a lot of cantaloupes that are sitting out there. And for one reason or another, they just weren't perfect enough to make it onto the truck. Or perhaps they were just missed, and those are plowed under. While people still in this country have nutrition problems and people go hungry. And then we have the question of nutrition in America. What is good for you? Uh, Michael Pollan's book, Omnivore's Dilemma, describes that all the real food is around the outside of the grocery store, where you have the produce on one side, the meats and stuff on the back wall, and the eggs and dairy on the other side, and in the middle is all that processed food. 
What's good for you? Certainly that's a perception. There's taste, there's culture involved, there's uh, education, there's convenience. I can just grab this, I can grab that. But what is good for us as a society? 67% of Americans are either overweight or obese now. We have increased diabetes, heart disease, and related functions that are due to uh, poor nutrition, lack of exercise, and other related issues. And then you must ask, does America really care <laughs> what it eats? Is it okay to eat a Twinkie? Meanwhile, people argue about the benefits of organic agriculture. And if you look at food as a culture in America and other places, especially in America, the appearance of food trumps nutrition. An apple with a blemish is no good, despite the fact that it might be nutritious anyway. The volume of servings trumps taste. The size of fruits and vegetables are important. Look at what's happened over the evolution of the selection for iceberg lettuce, uh, aside from all now of the different varieties that we now have. And the size of fruits. You see strawberries the size of half your fist. This is remarkable. Uh, and I think the taste has suffered. So the slide that I showed before, we just want good food, or maybe we just want food. I don't care what it is. Just give us food, give us calories. So this argument, the arguments that position conventional farming and organic farming really come down to this question of large-scale agriculture. When you start doing this on a large scale, things get wonky, no matter what kind of practice you're putting into it. Uh, we can regulate this and try to control this. And some time ago, someone asked me, Dr. Kausch, how do you grow a good tomato? And I would say, start with good genetics. You know, I mentioned the last time I like a burpees big boy. A beefsteak tomato, good genetics. And then I would recommend you grow it yourself and put a lot of TLC into that tomato. Put it in a good environment. And I'd also recommend that you go out and pick that tomato when it's ripe. Seasonally around here, that'd be sometime in August. And then go in and eat it. And I'll bet you you'll have a pretty good tomato. But when you start doing this on a large scale, things get a little funky. Large scale conventional farming, you know, uh, puts strain on water use. Look at the Colorado River. By the time it hits its delta, there's almost no Colorado River water in it. We've used it all in the Salinas Valley to grow our iceberg lettuce. Land use. How much arable land is really left in America? You say we got tons of land. Fly over it. Fly over it. There's tons of empty land. But guess what? You can't grow anything on it. And then there's pesticide use. What about that? Do we need it? If you're going to produce crops large scale, that's a question. Synthetic fertilizers. On the list of human achievements in the last century, I would put the Haber-Borsch reaction, the ability to make ammonia out of atmospheric nitrogen. That was huge. It increased yield tremendously globally. We can make ammonia out of atmospheric nitrogen. That's wild. On the other hand, the downside of that is a lot of that fertilizer goes into the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico, where there's a large dead zone that's growing because of eutrophic algal, algal production. Then there are questions like sustainability. Can we keep doing this? How much can you put into the land? On the other hand, this large-scale agricultural system provides us with a sustainable and reliable food source. It's economical. You can get cheap food plentiful. During the Eisenhower administration, the Secretary of Agriculture, then Earl Butts, hmm, interesting name, came up, had a mandate to produce a lot of food for America cheaply. And that resulted in subsidies for corn. And he increased the acreage of corn, and corn was able to be grown cheaply, resulting in cheap beef production, cheap pork production, cheap chicken. 
And here we have it. Corn is still subsidized. However, large-scale agriculture is also practical. We can do it. We know how to do it better than any country in the whole world. And it's scalable. You want to make more of it? We can make more of it. We have large yields, low cost. It's competitive. So new varieties are continuously produced and improved. Organic farming? What is organic farming? Well, actually, there are three rules. No synthetic pesticides, no synthetic fertilizer, and no GMOs. I'll get into this and analyze this in a second part of the lecture tonight. Any society goes through social movements or fads in which economically useless things become valued or useful things devalued temporarily. Nowadays, when almost all societies on earth are connected to each other, we cannot imagine a fads going so far that an important technology would actually be discarded. A society that temporarily turned against a powerful technology would continue to see it being used by neighboring societies and would have the opportunity to reacquire it by diffusion or would be conquered by neighbors <clears throat> if it failed to do so. That's a quote uh, out of Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, referring to the usefulness of new scientific technologies. I think si the history of science points out that this statement is resoundingly true. If something new is introduced that's useful to people, it will be used. It will be used, regardless of the controversies that surround it. So that concludes this part of just setting the stage and some of the controversies that come up. In the second part of this, I think we should examine the individual controversies and concerns and some of the issues about the use of genetic modified crops. Thanks. Let's take a break.